All right, my name is Shannon Jackson. I know many of you, but not all of you, and that's wonderful. Wonderful to have you here, and I look forward to meeting and getting to know better uh, many of us in this room. I am speaking to you today in a kind of double role as Associate Vice Chancellor, the first Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design at UC Berkeley, and also as the director of the Arts Research Center, which is the only ORU, the only organized research unit expressly devoted to research uh, and developing creative accomplishments in the arts. So I want to talk to you primarily uh, in the second role, but I did want to say something about the first role. Uh, as uh, in the creation of this position, uh, as a um, as somebody who's attending to the arts and design landscape across the campus. Uh, it, it came about after a, a result of a, a white paper co-authored by Dean Tony Cascardi that was basically recognizing the incredible creative culture we have here. This is just a sample uh, uh, a, 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 across a broad campus ranging across all different kinds of arts, arts forms. But also uh, in that white paper, recognizing that uh, it is sometimes difficult to bring that creative culture to the visibility it deserves, and that sometimes it is, a typical Berkeley story, somewhat atomized, that there are all kinds of creative things happening in all quadrants of the campus, and people can't find each other, they don't know about each other, uh, and that we needed a, a function for integration and for facilitating collaboration so that faculty don't have to start over and over every time they want to work together. So this is just a snapshot of the range of units that we have. Once we start to take an audit of all of the different creative forms and our commitments to uh, forms across the visual arts, the performing arts, the literary arts, across design forms in architecture, in industrial engineering, etc., we have a pretty wide and ranging culture. We have academic departments, we have centers of research, we have presenting organizations. Also, in the last count, looking at student clubs and co curricular experiences, we have uh, almost 200 arts and design student clubs once you get all of the type of drumming, the dance clubs, the video clubs, the poetry magazines. So it's a huge part of the life of the campus and the effort of this position is to bring that life to visibility and also give it a little bit more oxygen. Uh, so that position has, I think, many different domains in which we're working, and we've only been, after we've just completed a first startup year, but these are the areas in which I find myself working quite a bit. Obviously thinking about research, thinking about new kinds of uh, curricular innovation, how we impact the educational experience of our students, arts access, how we get students in the door of the arts, and also make sure that encountering creative forms and making creative forms as part of the habit and experience of, of uh, our life together at, as a university and many other domains. But research is what we're talking about today. And it has been uh, wonderful to be able to use the fact that I uh, uh, have been the director of the Arts Research Center this year at the same time to think about how we might direct the research efforts of ARC toward uh, uh, taking a wide embrace of our uh, incredible uh, creative culture. So over the last year, we have been uh, joining ARC. ARC has very helpfully, and with the help of Associate Director Lauren Pearson, did the launch pan of this wider arts and design initiative. But what we've also done over this last year with Lauren's help is to try to position ARC, at least for this year, not only as its own research unit, responsible for featuring its own work, but also trying to pivot in order to feature and point to and take a kind of audit of the research and creative accomplishment of many units. So over the last year, we've been orienting that way in order to have a, a, a bit more, have, get, a, get a wider umbrella and a wider sense of what all, we're going, what all is going on here. So it's been actually incredibly uh, propitious and helpful to have our new Vice Chancellor for Research, Paul Olivazados, also in the process of taking a much wider audit of our research culture. And 
the ga this gathering here is very much about me uh, trying to attempt to use uh, the efforts of the, of the Vice Chancellor for Research as a propeller for what we've been trying to do in the arts and design. I thought it would be helpful for us to be reminded of the language that uh, the VCR uh, put out in his call for uh, interdisciplinary collaborative research proposals. And here again, the attempt to try to abstract larger rubrics in which Berkeley might uh, uniquely excel. Uh, and rubrics, if I uh, understand correctly, that also gather domains and expertise and disciplines from across the campus. So here were some of the very, very big themes around equality and the future of work, entrepreneurship and the public interest, global change from understanding um, to resilience, and ideas to launch a new age of discovery. And if you also recall the, uh, recall the call, uh, the VCR put under there uh, a few examples, just for thought, about where, where we might align and realign ourselves. And the arts and design uh, landscape was invoked expressly in that call. Uh, this was how it ended, uh, how it appeared. And it was wonderful to see and to imagine how this landscape might mobilize these wider, uh, these wider and larger rubrics. So I think that within that, I think it's important to kind of step back before we start deeply into our morning and notice that a collaboration, an interdisciplinary collaboration across the arts and design might have very different character, very different kinds of goals depending on the positions and values of the collaborators. I think it's first really important to put forward that the arts and design fields have their own arcs of innovation. That uh, whether you're talking about the histories and practices of different art forms historically in different regions of the world um, across particular genres, that the arts are their own sites of innovation and many of us are very invested in tracking the history of innovation in the visual arts, of innovation in the performing arts, um, of innovation in, in industrial design and fabrication. And so that those are themselves disciplines. And at the same time, to recognize that these creative fields also function in many sites as catalysts for innovation in other fields, or as, uh, as vehicles for novel dissemination in other fields. So part of what we have here today are uh, uh, faculty who are interested in collaborating across arts and design, who are positioned in social science fields, who are positioned in science fields, technology, engineering, Math. I don't know if we have a math person here. I think that would be great. Uh, people from uh, the law school and Haas, right? Uh, Haas Business School. So we have uh, have different sub people who are disciplined in in other other fields that are not expressly the arts fields who are interested in collaborating, right? All right. So. I won't spend too much time on this, but I, I, in other, other domains, especially domains where we've been working across the arts and sciences, I occasionally find it helpful to recognize, as anyone who's been in an interdisciplinary collaboration knows, it, it often means that we have very different understandings um, and exposure to the discipline with which you're collaborating. And uh, even as I start to vet proposals that are coming from different faculty, uh, I, I, I think that many are working in and positioning their projects uh, in different ways. That there is, for instance, so what I've put out here is a, is a, is a very reductive axis. If you imagine what it is to work uh, with an arts discipline and ally with another discipline, if you imagine what it is to work from a more generalist understanding of a field to a more specialized understanding of a field, that different kinds of collaboration will, will mobilize and advance one discipline more than others. And I think it's just important to notice. Uh, some 
collaborations are really trying to get the highest level generalist articulation across the arts with the highest level generalist articulation of the sciences and they're putting they're putting together something great um, based on that wider uh, 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 goal of public access and general communication other types of fields actually are really trying to work hard and in innovating within say I call it quadrant um, quadrant two, that they're working on new ways of imagining sculpture, new ideas for, for uh, uh, deciding what the apparatus of the performing arts is. And they're invoking and collaborating with another discipline to help them do that. In quadrant three, we might have uh, uh, scientists who work in the environment, who work on climate, who are really interested in collaborating with the arts in order to help disseminate the latest, most important scientific discovery or innovation. And it might not be that the arts themselves um, progress as an art form. It might not be a new idea of photography that emerges. It might not be a new idea of sculpture, but we're mobilizing the creative um, energies of those fields to advance that goal, right? And when, I, I remember sharing this actually in a, in a, in a, in a, situ, in a situation where we were talking about the environment, especially around environmental art, and one environmental photographer said, you know what, I am so happy just being in quadrant three. I, I really don't need to innovate as a photographer. I don't need, I'm really happy to have this role. And others will not be, right? So I, I put that out there in order to just make sure that we can be somewhat gentle and responsive to each other and to sort of understand where, where our goals are and that they might be different from each other. A final thought that I wanted to put out there that is, uh, that is very much in, uh, I, I've been trying, as I said, to orient the goals of ARC toward trying to derive higher rubrics for embracing a wider research culture. And I've been inspired by what the Social Science Matrix Center has done in that mode, in particular, the way that they've begun to identify research streams, trying to articulate higher level rubrics uh, in which we all work. And you can see how much their research streams very much echo much of the language that the BCR has put forward. So over the last year, I've been not nearly as clean and efficient as these are. These are just so, um, uh, 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 it's lovely to get everything down to a key word. But I've been trying to think about what are our research streams? What are the higher level things in which faculty might work really collaboratively, not only on one, their own project, but on something quite grand that might uh, enable multi-unit collaboration? These are the three high level rubrics in which um, we've been working over the last year. It's been so heartening to see that they echo much of what the BCR had, uh, has put forward. And within that, you'll see that I think we, we have a, a draft of, it, of, of our own attempts to uh, share different kinds of research themes and articulations with our colleagues. That uh, over the last uh, year, we've been developing subfields within, uh, articulations of subfields within these higher level themes. And it has been so wonderful in the lab over the summer to receive proposals and engagement from across the campus that very much echo some of the language that we've been trying to develop. As I understand the UCR's process, and I am so pleased that you're here, Paul, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is an iterative process, and the process that we've been engaged in in ARC is also iterative. So this is also an opportunity, I know, for the BCR and for me to get feedback on even how we're articulating and how we could articulate better the diversity and ranginess of our creative research culture. All right? So I'll ask for help all the way along as we go. For now, you can also go to, the, uh, to our website in order to help us keep track. We're trying to keep track of some of these larger goals and also to, um, to uh, use the site as a place to point to events, lectures, working groups that uh, correspond to some of these larger themes. So I wanted to do, uh, offer that as context for this. 
This gathering does not reflect everything that everybody might work on across the arts and design fields at Berkeley. Uh, but within the, over the summer, to have proposals come from our faculty uh, that are exciting, that have a great deal of connection across the across creative forms, across uh, um, uh, uh, the, the STEM fields, and also where it often seems uh, where there, the, the goal of social impact seems a, a unified theme in different ways across many different um, forms and collaborations. So I'll pause there. I'll pause also to thank once again um, BCR Paul Olivazados for even uh, uh, hosting and getting the idea for this forum and being such an incredible leader of our research culture. Paul, I hope you'll let me uh, initiate an applause. <laughs> Uh, to thank um, the VCR host staff, Verna Boy and Tiff Dressen for their incredible collaboration, Tiff and Verna. <laughs> and finally, also to thank uh, uh, Associate Director Lauren Pearson for her incredible collaboration all this past year and now for this forum. Lauren Pearson. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask um, Paul himself to come up and tell us what he was really trying to do, in his own <laughs> words. And then we're going to have uh, uh, presentations, very, very short presentations from our faculty leads, some responses, and then breakout sessions on particular topics so we can dive deeper. So for now, help me welcome Paul Alessandro. Things under that umbrella 
have been developing beautifully over time, but all of them can be strengthened by our ability to engage with, uh, in an open way with all the people that want to help us. And, and, and that coalition building has, has really been very um, important. And so that's really part of my intent here, is to help us to build umbrellas and coalitions under which we'll sit many innovative ideas. And those are not in competition with each other, they're really synergistic, and the goal is to create an environment where those things can all thrive. Uh, an observation that I will make about Berkeley uh, is that it is exceptionally great at creating these um, local, highly adapted uh, cultures that are very, um, they, they are exquisitely adapted to their ecological niches and they compete um, globally well, they compete globally well beyond what their resources would seem to suggest they ought to be able to do just because they're so, so the degree of alignment amongst the people in those is so strong. And that's an enormous asset for us. But this ability also to, to work at a larger scale um, is something that our community can become stronger at. And by doing that, I think we'll be able to help all of those local cultures to thrive even more. And, and so that's my intent with this. And I'm so thrilled to see all of you here. And it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful thing. And, and I hope to, you know, I'm going to spend the morning with you and, and follow uh, all that's going on here. And I really want to be your uh, partner in helping you uh, create a coalition that will be very powerful as it engages with society and, and as it stays true to our values uh, as an institution, to our ethos of wanting to change the world uh, in the best way. That's us. And so I, I, I'm thrilled. I wish you the best of success in this. And um, I, I'm really excited that we're kicking off with this topic. And uh, we'll see how it all goes. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we'll follow the order that I hope you see in your sheets. And uh, we'll ask Ken Goldberg, a first faculty lead, to come to speak about a meta topic, creativity. So let me uh, get out of the way here that I'm an engineer. And um, see so we're a bit in the minority. Um, <clears throat> maybe I can just start with a quick uh, reminder. Well, I want to remind minorities. No, but, uh, you know, how can you tell, the old joke goes, how do you tell a, um, an um, um, introverted engineer from an extroverted engineer? And um, as you know, the uh, introverted engineer, when you talk to them, always looks down at their shoes, you're talking. And then an extroverted engineer um, will look down at your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I knew this was going to happen. It's going to spin for a while until this kicks in. Um, but, in the try to squeeze things down into three minutes, the, um, what I want to talk about is this idea that's very raw, very um, unformed, and is, uh, is really a hunch. And so I want to, I want to uh, just throw it out there um, with uh, Shannon's encouragement. Um, and it's, it's, it's a term that I call, um, gosh, I don't know where that thing goes. I call multiplicity. And, Of course, they have media problems. <laughs> okay. Well, the idea of multiplicity is that he, it really comes out of my work with, um, with robotics. And it, as you know, this is a big topic right now. There's a huge amount of press about the advances in robotics. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the news, it's in pop culture. There's uh, major results out there, like the result of um, computer beating uh, the world champion in Go. People are very concerned about what this is all going to, uh, what does this mean? Is, it going, is AI going to suddenly somehow take over and surpass us? And so we have um, this concept that you may have heard of called the singularity. And this comes out of science fiction. It's this uh, mythical point when suddenly uh, computers and machines will start to become extremely fast and, and become better and better and sort of surpass human intelligence. And this is predicted to be near by people like Ray Kurzweil and others. And I think this idea is very, uh, is, 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 is wrong, for one. And uh, second of all, extremely distracting and problematic and, and actually damaging. It's very disillusioning for many people because they feel like 
why bother? Because um, you know we're going to be obsolete. So I've been thinking about this, and I, I want to came up with this idea that to counter singularity, and that I call multiplicity. And multiplicity, the idea is that rather than a single monolithic AI kind of taking over uh, uh, humanity, this is really about the idea of humans and machines working together. And this is, I think, actually quite constructive, and it's something that's actually that's happening right now. So if you look at something like Google search engine, which seems remarkably intelligent, comes up with great suggestions all the time, it's because it's actually combining human input. It's integrating human, human input all the time with algorithms and machines, uh, diversity of machines, and the diversity of humans. And that's what is at the core of this idea of multiplicity. Now, this actually has some, uh, some, some, some strong uh, precedent in, in statistics. Uh, that it's well known that a uh, random forest, which actually was developed here at Berkeley, another uh, achievement here, was um, shows that if you have a diverse collection of uh, classifiers, they'll always be better, perform better than any single classifier, or any single tree. So a forest is better than a tree, and it's basically a, you can show, you can quantify the benefit of a diverse collection of uh, of algorithms. And we also know that something analogous is happening with um, with people. That there's some recent results that are really interesting. That there's something called collective IQ. Basically, like what is the IQ of a group? And it, the results are showing that again, it has to do with diversity. That if you just get the smartest people in the room together in a group, they rarely perform better than a diverse group of people. And so this is a very early science. It's not well understood. It's something people are are, um, are think is it's extremely important. So this idea. Um, I want to posit this term, and I'm not married to it, we can discard it, um, but I think it's just something to work with, and I wanted to test it out here with this uh, fantastic group. It actually comes from Deleuze and Guattari. It's a, it's a term that actually has a long history. Bergson used it, and others, and, um, and they, have some, they have some interesting traction. Something, again, we want to try and find some new way of, uh, of conceptualizing what we're doing. The key to it really is diversity. And this is something I think is also a, that we see is, is of interest here in the um, in, in the initiatives, and um, and it's really about this the human very human characteristics about creativity that I think are intersect arts and design, and actually very importantly um, the sciences and the and technology. So it's 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 this idea of hybrid vigor, which is very well accepted in the bio, biological um, field. That if you have diversity of uh, of DNA, that that will allow a uh, system and ecology, as sort of as Paul alluded to in his comments, uh, performs better, is more robust and resilient. I always have to quote C.P. Snow. Um, C.P. Snow, the clashing point of two cultures. That's where breakthroughs happen. I think this is Berkeley is very interestingly positioned in this regard. Um, and I want to say, actually, some of this I've been thinking about, uh, you know, some students asking recently about, well, should I go to Stanford, should I go to Berkeley? And, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think, what is it about Berkeley? Like, it has, and I try not to be too, you know, uh, parochial about this, but I do believe we have something that's somehow this, this magic sauce, this secret sauce that's about the diversity, that the fact is our students come here because they want to be immersed in that kind of, diversity, that, that slight chaos that I truly believe actually gives birth to really interesting ideas. And by the way, if you haven't seen, there's this wonderful website, which you can, uh, it's on, online about history and discoveries in Berkeley. It's just great to spend some time there because it's a timeline of uh, all these great things and you click on them and they're just fantastic. You'd be super proud of them. You'll find always things that you didn't realize were de developed here. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing, I mean, we're, I think it goes without saying, but we're all super proud of it. And it's, it's a consistent new ideas, amazing ideas. Um, like uh, CRISPR, Cas9, comes out of Berkeley, of all places. So I think this is true, this comes out of our rebel instincts, our basically, uh, you know, questioning of authority, questioning of conventional wisdom, and our ability to sort of, at the same time, really welcome kind of friction and diversity. Uh, <laughs> Are you seeing my hope? This is what my day looks like. Okay. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, stop there. Um, master of technology here, but I want to say uh, that the what I, the other the other couple of slides I was gonna show is that. Um, we are, there is some history here, and there's actually the Institute for Personality Studies and Psychology that actually did a very elaborate study of creativity in the 1950s. 
And I just discovered this recently. And um, does anyone here from that, from that area? Um, it's, uh, I'm going to reach out to some of the people if there's interest. That uh, we, can, we can draw from that. They interviewed a number of, of very, very uh, uh, famous ar architects and painters and designers and musicians. Um, uh, Robert Zimmerman was one of them, apparently, at the time. And they were really interested in understanding creativity. So I want to dig up some of that history because it's relevant today. And I think it's something that we, could, we may be able to investigate together. Thank you. Thank you. the mashup of knowledges as uh, so <coughs> met. We were all told to sort of restrict ourselves to three slides and three minutes. <laughs> and I know that I adhere to the, the three slides rule. Okay, uh, we'll see what happens. The three minutes rule. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think I need to issue a bit of a trigger warning because my images are somewhat disturbing images, um, but they are the images that sort of motivated a number of us on campus to kind of get together and respond to um, Shannon's call um, and um, the Vice Chancellor's call. Uh, so uh, I'll just begin. This, this is happening. November of last year, um, Chicago officials released the police dash cam video of the October, 14, October 2014 fatal shooting of Laquan McDonald by a Chicago police officer. These almost feel arbitrary. I could have chosen three different slides. July of, the early of, uh, July of this summer, Charles Kinsey is shot while trying to help a patient with autism in North Miami, Florida. A few weeks earlier, Diamond Reynolds uses Facebook Live to stream the aftermath of the shooting of her boyfriend, Philando Castile, by a Minnesota police officer. Um, I'm, this is uh, the sad image of that um, event. Um, our group was motivated by two things, both a set of questions, a kind of inquiry we wanted to, kind of wanted to pose about social media um, and race, but also expertise, the fact that we have a number of people on this campus and other UC, uh, UC campuses um, who are already working on these questions of social media and race. So um, the Diamond Reynolds hey, video is um, we got pulled over for a video a in the back. where and the police just he's, he's, he's covered. He the thing that matters to me is her narration, live streaming this event as it's happening. The knot of, I, like, talk, I, I describe it as the knot of the utopian and the dystopian, the use of the technology to record the event, but the fact that the event is recording a kind of act of um, um, incredible violence, which made this event, or the live streaming of it, simultaneously incomprehensible to us, but also necessary to confront. We felt the need to kind of confront it. And I so tried to kind of work out a set of like four dimensions that, um, to, to social media that we wanted to kind of bring um, uh, um, to the fore in, um, in the, the Race and Digital Life project. The first has to do with the category of immediacy and how immediacy is being redefined by social media. What is the, this new temporality of immediacy that's sort of evident in a video such as this one? The compression of time of death with a kind of almost YouTube style of self-narration. What makes it possible to kind of um, have the experience of death and its narration exist kind of simultaneously in a kind of immediacy. The juxtaposition of this, the immediacy of death with her kind of mediatized sang froid. The second dimension, um, and this is where the technology uh, refuses to cooperate. Sorry if my, if my, if my um, uh, font is too small. Um, um, in, the, in the call, of course, uh, um, Shannon offered uh, help with our presentations, and I did not avail myself of that help. So it's my fault. Um, okay. The second dimension has to do with design and our feeling that these questions of immediacy could not be posed absent a focus on the structure and design of digital formats in social media, right? So ask yourself, in terms of your cell phones, in terms of your smartphone, we can't even call them cell phones anymore, how many push notifications do you have activated, right? To give you this news as it's happening um, 
uh, um, on your Facebook page, um, our video set to autoplay so that as you're watching Facebook, these videos just start to sort of play. You almost, I noticed that on my Facebook, I, have, I would have to stop the videos because they were already set up to like roll as I'm kind of going through my Facebook feed. So the question of how, how the media is designed and how we structure it for our own sort of viewing and consumption is another kind of question, the second sort of dimension or second um, axis of inquiry we wanted to sort of pose. The third has to do with activism, whether or not this is an act of activism, this live streaming of this event, and the broader question of how social media is being used in the way of activism was a, um, a question we wanted to pose. And then lastly, and I've kind of already sort of suggested this, that the, um, um, the nod of the utopian, the, the dystopian is the sense of like, not a, a contradiction that's sort of part of um, uh, social media, the way in this example, um, in these examples, the way in which violence is perpetrated in the visual field and redressed in the visual field, right? So like, um, uh, there's no sense in which social media is sort of failing to live up to its sort of utopian or ideal form. It's simply sort of crossed or marked by these contradictions of um, perpetrating a certain kind of violence and redressing the violence at the same time. So we can't have a kind of utopian or a dystopian. We, we used to sort of write about media in, in sort of utopian or dystopian modes, but we can't have a utopian or dystopian vision of the technology, and as humanists, we felt that our task was to kind of apply a critical lens on the contradictions that shape the media. In terms of thinking about well, how to like how to like address uh, race and social media, um, I, I thought there might be three kind of axes. Um, one would be sort of historical, and, and as humanists, a, lot, a number of us um, are very good at kind of giving these long views of of um, of uh, what's happening, that this happening now. Um, black life is a kind of premature encounter with death. Um, the utter familiarity and expectation with which um, Diamond greets this violence. Those of us who work on slavery, segregation, lynching, are these metaphors for what, what's happening or are they the paradigm, like the sort of uh, the, the, the structural kind of undergirdings of what happened? We work on racial violence in the form of like Matt Turner, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, these are all like contexts in which we could sort of make sense of what's happening in terms of race and social media. But they seem like inadequate to really explain what's going on um, in um, terms of race and social media. Another kind of uh, mode of inquiry we, um, would be kind of comparative, comparing the way, say, we talk about old media watching television, tuning into the news versus social media, the kind of immediacy, the 24-7, the, the, the you know, my niece, she sleeps with her iPhone, you know, like that sense in which like, it's, never, it's never off. And so sort of earlier models would have been something like Gitlin's um, model of the media and the whole world is watching, the sense that you, you tune into the media. Media sort of provides or certifies leaders. Media provides a sense of rel relevance in terms of news. Um, it has very specific actors in terms of the media industry and in terms of a media audience. But, though, but, but in social media, the set, of set, the, the set of actors is incredibly complex in the sense that consumers in, can become per, producers of media, etc. So, so wanting to kind of think comparatively about the ways we sort of talk about media in the old sense versus social media is another kind of dimension of our sort of inquiry. And then lastly, of course, in terms of like um, the call from A and D, of course, there's a question of like social impact. And, the, and the, the feeling that as humanists, um, though we may have our own sort of scholarly pursuits and um, deeply historical scholarly pursuits, this is happening now. And the feeling is that they, they're pressing, that, that, that these sort of, they almost, they, they, they seem kind of daily, um, um, I, I want to call them intrusions um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the area of social media. Um, they present these kind of vexed examples um, uh, that urge a set of questions on us as humanist scholars that we need to address address in our time, to which we need to be present and alert. Um, um, then there's the question of like the expertise that's sort of arrayed at Berkeley. 
um, Abigail Kosnick's work, um, her, her project, The Color of New Media, um, which is sponsored by the Center for Race and Gender, is an, a, is an example of this work that's already ongoing at Berkeley. Um, um, Aaron McElroy's anti-eviction mapping project. Um, uh, A&D has sort of pointed us to the new minor in journalism in the digital age as like areas sort of across um, um, uh, the humanities um, and uh, social sciences that where this work is already being done. And there are also other UC faculty um, who are also sort of working on these questions. So that, so I kind of focused on just the, so one arena, the sort of arena of kind of violence and activism, but another um, arena that's of interest to us is the sort of work, this world of um, uh, 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 website curation um, that's happening right now. Kimberly Drew is a great example of this. She's, a, she's the manager of social media at the Met in New York, but she has her own sort of website where she essentially it's a kind of pedagogy in sort of uh, African black art in the kind of Met collection. Um, so she kind of uses her access uh, to the Met collection to sort of produce this um, site. Um, she, she's also sort of a key player in this group uh, called the Black Art Incubator, but another kind of curatorial site on the web um, for sort of disseminating um, knowledge about sort of black art. Uh, and then lastly, of uh, course, um, the sort of linguistic invention with the Twitter speak um, and, and the sort of questions of appropriation that sort of circulate uh, around the generation of new vernaculars in these sort of new media. Um, I mean, I, I just sort of threw out some of the kind of funnier ones, you know, mm -hmm. like Oscar So White or, you know, uh, the crying Jordan memes and all those things um, uh, that sort of circulate uh, on Twitter. So that's, is that three minutes? It's <laughs> 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 And thanks, Paul, for putting together this uh, call because it's really brought together a conversation. Um, my name is Eric Pauls. I'm uh, in electrical engineering and computer science. I'm also a part of this new Jacobs Institute for Design and Innovation. But as Shannon pointed out, I'm also a part of the Berkeley Center for New Media. The project that uh, it's really uh, incredible that this has sort of generated some discussions already around this topic of what we're calling creative hybrid making. And at least this is the sort of early stages, and right now it's representatives from uh, engineering and from architecture, but we're hoping very quickly this will grow to a larger group of, of, of faculty and students and practitioners as well. The, uh, the idea is you could, so to give you a little bit more background, there's, we really, I really feel, I think, the, the, the group of us that there's something unique about uh, Berkeley, the DNA here, and how I really want to, we've all been sort of drawn here to actually celebrate lots of disciplines and we like to foreground that in our, our making. And we're noticing that there's a lot of conversation, obviously, about digital fabrication and, and 3D printing and things that seem, you know, important and certainly part of the discussion. But we like, as uh, researchers, as sort of artists, we like to actually go beyond that. We want to sort of foreground the natural uh, and, bring, and really highlight creativity as a part of that process. So just to give you a little bit more framing about that, uh, this idea of what do we kind of mean, creative and hybrid and making. And creative is really important. I, I pulled this quote from, from Eleanor Roosevelt, who really says that the thing you really, the most important thing you give a child or anyone is really the sense of curiosity. And I think this value is so important that we're maybe losing sight of it. So what we've said is how can we really foreground that in this making, this form giving, things about the material, the, the kinds of objects we make, these are all sort of decisions that can be uh, problem solving, but they can also be political, and we really want to embrace all of those topics. The hybrid, um, this idea of uh, Marshall McLuhan has this quote, the hybrid or the meaning of two media is a moment of truth and a revelation from which a new form is born. And this is really pointing to this idea that we believe there's something really 
not just exciting, but perhaps revolutionary in rethinking that moment of truth. Uh, and, it, and it spans a lot of hybrid um, sort of areas, which I'll say something about in just a second. And obviously, the maker movement, which admittedly has its own kind of uh, drivers in terms of new economic movements and other kind of advances in science, and it's bringing more people to the field of the conversation. But we really want to go beyond just this conversation about makers and maker movement and, and, and think much more broadly about uh, you know, empowering new kinds of authorships of uh, sort of built materials and landscapes and uh, the environment at large and, and push on what making could mean for education and for kind of a criti critical making kind of approach. So I'll say one more thing about this hybrid, and this is a key part of our thinking, is that really we're not in one discipline. In fact, we're not in one material. We're not in one kind of uh, practice. And so this at least the proposal, the discussion is really around what lies at these exciting intersections. So uh, I think many of you are familiar with, you know, Ron Rill has worked with lots of different materials and he's really pushed uh, the discussion forward about the kinds of organic and reused materials that can be used. Uh, Bjorn Hartman and some of his uh, colleagues have looked at how you can rethink tooling and make it augmented and really in, kind of create new ways for people to express their creativity. Um, and then some of these other pictures in the middle are around combining materials for electronics or putting things on the skin with uh, you know, electronic tattoos that respond and interact with you. So making doesn't have this form that's standard pieces of plastic that you make. We really want to think broadly about the landscape. And then uh, Simon Schlechter's looked a lot at how the tooling and the rethinking of how the design methods can embrace more bio-inspired designs things that actually look at flexible structures and modeling them, and then these communities. So I mentioned hybrid materials, hybrid methods, hybrid practitioners, hybrid communities, and hybrid applications. And we don't really use the term lightly, we actually do want to have that foreground of a discussion about bringing different people to the table about communities. On the last slide, I did have three slides, by the way. <laughs> Uh, is just some, some takeaways of where we're thinking. And this is really great that Shannon's called us because we're trying to have some discussions around this. And one of them is sort of perhaps democratizing innovation and making. So we want to address the issues of inequality, sort of who's not involved or who is involved in the conversation that's very important to us. Uh, exploring the intersection of domain knowledge. So you can imagine uh, an architect, an engineer, a biologist, someone from rhetoric, or someone in performance studies. What lies at the intersection where you're thinking about these physical forms? Uh, someone in public policy. Uh, there's also leveraging the computational system. So we're not sort of Luddites that just want to go and work with materials that are and, and methods that aren't involved in computation, but we want to do them in a poetic way that really makes it more meaningful, draws in more participation and more creativity. And uh, finally, empowering individuals and communities with novel tools uh, for expressive culture and even new forms of activism. So really kind of coming back to Berkeley's roots, there is certainly uh, a, a whole range of things that are kind of problem solving, but we're also interested in problem making and problem framing. And we want to present tools for people to question the progress of the technologies and, and the forms and the media. And I think it's really uh, surprising because this was not done in any collaboration, but it really resonates with what Ken was mentioning earlier about the multiplicity. <laughs> so it's this idea of really bringing together these disciplines and sort of also celebrating this idea of the kind of Berkeley Center for New Media, which I think has been a historic place to bring together this conversation. So I'll leave it at that. We have more questions than answers, but hopefully there's, I know I see many of you here that do this work in this area, and so hopefully we continue this conversation. We can have uh, more people to join in, uh, in sort of the discussion or, or help guide this. So thank you, Shannon and Paul. happy that UCOP released your Dan. Uh, Dan, okay. <laughs> Dan came in from nuclear engineering, energy resources group, and many other fronts. <coughs> and public policy there. Okay. Thanks a lot. I can first do the basic thing of plugging this in. Well, I really want to thank everyone here, and particularly what Shannon has done to kind of get dialogue going around what are we creating both at Berkeley and in California and more broadly around sustainability ideas? And how do we actually learn new tools to communicate them? And so there's a wide array of actors on campus. Um, many of you have already interacted with Becky, the Berkeley Energy and Climate uh, Initiative that Paul Wright directs, and it's a fantastic gathering point for these kinds of conversations. 
What I want to highlight in my three minutes, I'll definitely stick to it, is how quickly things are evolving and how much the dialogue up until now has been dominated by a science engineering mindset and how clearly the limitations of that are something that we have to break out of. And this is an area really near and dear to me. So I'll show a 17 second video and it just highlights where the science has, has, has gone to a sort of beautiful artistic perspective. So this is 17 seconds of all climate change science wrapped up into a little movie. This is something that NASA produces, which is now something you can, you can go to the Met and look at. And it is a picture of the Earth. The pictures stitched together to make this movie are taken when the sea ice over the North Pole is at its minimum. So it's not a specific day. It's only retrospectively when was the ice at its smallest extent, obviously late in summer, just about this time of year. And this shows just the movie of that change in the, on the ice, and then of course a little bit of a geeky overlay of the science of the extent of that ice. Those of you who saw movies like Chasing Ice will see, have seen versions of it. And what you get is this kind of beautiful record, uh, very troubling on the science side in terms of how much polar ice we have. And how rapidly it's shrunk. And if you kind of average out the higher and low years, what you see is we have dropped the amount of ice over the North Pole by 50% over three decades. Shocking transition, decades quicker than scientists projected just a few years ago. And this type of, of science, which is now very clear, and then some really bold political statements, in particular by President Obama and Premier Xi, allowed the Paris Climate Conference for all those who went to declare wonderful victory. So it's his job at the time. She plans to have his job in a year's time. Um, and the French declared that, well, we finally grew up at this COP. We got to 21, the age of reason, things happened. But there's lots of important areas where this mixture of science, not just how to communicate, but how to co-create the knowledge around fracking, around environmental injustice, around gender and racial lines, are not being portrayed well. So I have six colleagues and friends who are trying to make movies about things like the global alliance on cook stoves that Secretary Clinton championed. She brought $100 million to focus on what seems like the most simple, mundane technologies to get the message out how polluting this environment is and who gets affected. That's a story which there are key elements in public health, epidemiology, um, atmospheric chemistry, but the real story is how do you put this in a broader context? California is creating the story that I see many authors of it in the room to take our clean energy content. We missed our 2010 target, but through a party to say, oh, we <laughs> almost got there. We're on pace for this one, and just last week we passed a target to say by 2030, we will have crossed the threshold, over 50% clean energy. And it's generated all kinds of wonderful literature. Um, some of it based deeply in science, some of it less so. I won't say which is which. But <laughs> <laughs> these narratives are critical. And so when I want to highlight why the science is key, but it is amazing how stupid the science-only perspective, and I say so as a physicist, can be. The narrative on smoking is, you know, we gave cigarettes to GIs, we had talk show hosts that smoke, doctors endorsed to cartoon characters, presidents and movie stars sometimes together, smoked, um, and we tell the story, and then our first level of solutions, this is an airplane map that all of us remember. Were we really ever so dumb that we thought the smoke molecules didn't wouldn't cross those barriers in the cabins. That's not a story in the science. That is in the communication, the telling, the understanding of the story. And I think, are we really this dumb is an example of not, are we this dumb, but we didn't find ways to work across the technical and the arts divides to really figure out how to do it. And we need a whole new generation of scholars, activists. We have some on campus. Many of you, I hope, have seen the movie. Um, that we hope will win a bunch of awards we just brought out that is a narrative about climate change but in the broader context of land use change and deforestation and food and climate and new initiatives on campus like the Berkeley Food Institute are players in this but their stories need not just to be communicated well by the arts 
but crafted initially. And I think that's a place where the science community has a big mea culpa. We haven't done it. And so I'm hoping that through this effort, we can really find a way to co-create the knowledge, not wait for knowledge and then find what are the good or bad ways to get the story out. So I'm hoping many of you will find myself, Paul Wright, um, Bill Collins from the Climate Readiness Institute and talk about how we might do that design process from the beginning, not wait for the science, but really derive where the science and engineering and information goes on. So I think I stuck, oh. not quite to three, but. Thank you. All right. Uh, I put myself down as a faculty surrogate for a field uh, we're calling curation across disciplines. And I'll try to even be less than, less than three minutes, largely to say that the field of curation to which Stephen has already alluded um, is arguably a field that is expanding, sometimes problematically. Everyone's a curator these days. Uh, but I think it's important, first of all, to think about uh, uh, the ways that Berkeley has cultivated curation, the resources that we have around us for cultivating it further. So on the one hand, from an arts perspective, curators might be uh, officially associated with the visual art world. I'm looking at Sherry right there, representing the MPFA. Thank you for being here, Sherry. And also, um, as, as many of us started to, uh, 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 whether it was in our teaching, in our uh, own research, we began to realize how much the expansion of art forms, uh, the expansion and rethinking about what the role of the arts are in social life, actually started to change the job description of a curator in many ways. So that on the what we now have, we have and have at other museums and curators of architecture, curators of photo. Of course, all throughout this campus, we have curators in our science museums. And interesting, curator is an academic title in the sciences and not an academic title in the arts. Isn't that interesting? My, my budget committee head for a second there. Uh, more, uh, this kind of curation, curation of film and new media. Uh, uh, Eric uh, Dan just showed Charles Ferguson's film, which was shown at the MPFA. Uh, what does it mean to actually be a, cura a curator of film? Also, what does it mean to be a curator of forms that, uh, that aren't necessarily objects anymore? More and more in museums and in other kinds of uh, large arts organizations, uh, those who have used to have the title of outreach or education director are now curators of com curators of public practice, curators of pedagogy, curators of education. What does that mean? More and more site-specific work is happening uh, all around. In, in our there's site-specific work that happens outside of museum context, outside of um, theaters and official arts organizations. What is the skill set of people who are making those projects? Um, and as Stephen alluded to, uh, all kinds of curation of the digital sphere. So that now at this point, many arts organizations think of the engagement curator as often a digital curator. And as it turns out, many, many of our alumni all have these jobs. Uh, uh, many, of, whether they're PhD students or undergraduates, they have these jobs. So it's, I think that we've been producing curators, whether we actually kind of claimed it or not. And I'm interested in both curation, and many of us are interested in curation as an object, as a research field, as, a, as something that is changing and, uh, and whose future we want to track and uphold, and also as a, as a curricular domain. But what might it be to no mobilize these assets, especially once we think about the difference between being uh, studying curation at a research university than, say, an art school, where many of the programs are now. Actually, arguably, what you need in a, as, a, as a curator right now is exposure to public policy. You need to have uh, exposure to ethnic studies. You might, you, you want to take a course in um, the College of Environmental Design. So I, I put that out there, and how can we mobilize this culture for that field? And I'll end, I think, hopefully even less than two minutes, just to sort of put out that these are some of the domains many of us have been working at, that this is itself an interdisciplinary practice whose expansion might benefit from uh, being cited at a research university, not only an art school, that it itself is a method of research and dissemination. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a field to study. Many of us are interested in studying it. We're interested in, in deepening exposure inside of the curriculum. 
and that, again, uh, invoking Stephen, it's becoming a ubiquitous social phenomenon um, in this sort of era of participation, the 21st century era of participation, that, that is uh, something we want to track and that Berkeley should be really good at tracking. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Nora Silver from Haas. Hello. Okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nora Silver. I'm on the faculty at Haas, and my area is social impact. I want to start with this for two reasons. One is very personal. I'm from Philadelphia. This is a view I see every day when I leave Berkeley to go home. And that is to say the second reason, which is we live in a very special place. Before we talk about Berkeley, I want to talk about where we live and work. Okay? It's the Bay Area. We know that um, it's the heart of innovation. The Atlantic Monthly City Lab this past summer noticed as they were talking about geographies and regions, they called San Francisco Bay Area the nation's lead in innovation. That's not a surprise to us. But what does that mean for us? At, in the Bay Area and in Berkeley. So we have innovation in a couple of different areas, at least. One is we know in technology. We also have innovation in business. We have disruptive companies like Uber, or we have social enterprises like Fair Trade USA or Revolution Foods. So in the whole business and technology area, that's what we're known for in innovation. We're also known for an innovation in the arts. So we're known to world-class large institutions to mid-sized institutions like Yerba Buena or Oakland Museum, and to very small startup organizations like the Minnesota Street Project or another one, Destiny Arts. Okay? That's the environment we live in at UC Berkeley. And at Berkeley, as the top research university in the world, we have some standout departments. We have many of them, but I'm going to focus on two because I want to ask a question about how we can gather those two often discrepant departments together to ask some larger questions. So the first is business. We have one of the top 10 business schools in the country. It's known for innovation. It's known for social impact. I feel very lucky every day to be working at Berkeley. We also have a, world, a range of world-class arts departments, presenting organizations, research units. So the question that I'm bringing to you is really, are there ways that we can have exchanges, unusual ex exchanges, Berkeley kinds of exchanges, between the business and the arts? I'm not the artist in the group. You can tell that from my <laughs> slide, OK? But what I wanted to portray was um, some of the things that are already happening in our exchanges. So in terms of the arts, what it can give and lend to business, we have classes up at the business school. We have Clark here who teaches them over there in storytelling and creative problem solving and um, movement and nonverbal skills and design thinking and taking different perspectives. So we know in the business school we need at least that from the arts. We don't know what we don't know. What else do we need? And in terms of the arts, what the business school has to offer are the kinds of nuts and bolts that help artists, galleries, museums, art institutions survive and thrive. So it's from business modeling, to financial development, to measuring impact, to leadership skills. How do you lead these institutions in a time of change? So we're already thinking about these kinds of things. We're thinking about arts leaders in the world. Could we bring them to Berkeley to teach them some of these business skills? Can we infuse what we do in business with the arts? So there's an exchange is one question I want to ask anybody who's interested, what else should we be exchanging? People in both of these disciplines and outside in other disciplines can see where the connections are. We also want to ask a second question. And that second question is, what might we co-create together that can enrich the entire Berkeley campus and the world beyond. So my field is social impact. What would it look like if we really teamed together in terms of community problem solving, both locally, Berkeley, Bay Area, and way beyond? What would it look like if we really took on how do you communicate persuasively in many, many different ways? What about cultural entrepreneurship? Is that something we should look at? I think people are looking 
you know, with questioning looks, I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> and I said, you know, is there a way to infuse the cultural arts with entrepreneurship and infuse entrepreneurship with the cultural arts? So the questions that we're trying to bring to you and to the table of anyone interested is, how do we fuse these together <coughs> to answer larger cultural questions, challenges, social problems that we all care about? Thank you. And what we are trying to do actually is to try to uh, imagine if we can use the new very hot topic of virtual reality and, uh, and the augmented reality to create a massively interactive cyber platform you know, for different type of applications. And uh, since I'm a, a, also an engineer, so in, in the three minute talk I'm going to use um, three movies, um, hopefully uh, you, know, uh, you guys can actually relate to, to explain some of the you know, engineering jargon and so on. And of course, you know, I will be more than happy to you know, discuss with you and on any ideas or comments that you have. So basically, you know, uh, as we all know, that uh, in 2016, uh, AR and VR are a you know, very hot topic, at least in Bay Area and also around the world. But actually, uh, in academia, so this concept of AR and VR has been around for more than 50 years. But unfortunately, or you know, fortunately, um, uh, in, in, the, in the first 50 years, the most uh, uh, focused applications that people have been using uh, AR and VR are primarily in military applications uh, and in uh, education and in engineering training. But however, you know, since we are in California and uh, we have a large group of uh, people in performing arts and designers and so forth, we know that actually a lot of very you know, bright visionaries uh, from the Hollywood, they actually have envisioned if you can get a hold of virtual reality and augmented reality, how can you actually change people's lives, normal people's lives. For example, um, in Star Trek, and then we are you know, all too familiar with the concept of holodeck. In this case, you will be alone, you know, uh, navigating in the space, but uh, you know, you can have this virtual reality room that actually can, you know, illustrate a very vivid um, uh, 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 forest scene, beach scene, or even recreating some historic movies that you can actually, uh, you know, be part of that. And also, the second movie I want to mention is the movie of uh, Star Wars. Uh, in this case, actually, you know, arguably, you can you can say that you know the message, this hologram of uh, from Princess Leia, basically set off the entire motion of Star Wars. Without the hologram, without augmented reality, and then we may not actually have the wonderful story of Star Wars, right? <laughs> All right. Um, now, fast forward to today. Um, now, actually, um, so you may actually ask us how far is this vision, sci-fi sci vision of uh, augmented reality and virtual really can actually change people's lives? Um, actually, you know, fortunately, the answer is now. Because today, in 2016, uh, you could actually get, a hand, uh, get your hands with some you know, commercial systems that is available today, such as from Facebook, from Microsoft, from Sony, and then you know, they actually try to um, uh, release a, a, a virtual reality uh, uh, headset um, in October, very soon. And even in, in China, Alibaba, uh, in a, a few months ago, actually uh, started a, a new business model called BiPlus, whereby actually you can virtually shop all kinds of products online so that you don't actually have to go to Target. One of the reasons you have to go to Target, go to Best Buy, is because you want to, re you want to look at the real thing. Now, if you can actually see those things in virtual reality, then probably you can actually, you know, those, you know, online um, uh, 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 business can be more, you know, compatible and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, how is this, this going to be related to Berkeley? So let me actually uh, play, uh, play a, a short video. <coughs> that is made the 10 years ago. Second, it's interactive. Ideas get dissected. 
This is democracy in action. Now, this is a project that the uh, uh, from the Tesla Immersion Lab. It's a collaboration, collaboration with, uh, with Professor Krishna Paichi and Lisa Wymore and other collaborators. And it's changing not just our ideas, but our relationships with each other. So here I am, dancing in a virtual world. Now my dancing partners are real, but they're actually located several hundred miles from here. So I'm really dancing with their virtual three-dimensional image transmitted to me in real time. And simultaneously, my image is being transmitted to them. This new technology is called teleimmersion. Three-dimensional technologies like teleimmersion have virtually limitless possibilities. They could be the evolutionary successor of the telephone that might even reduce air travel. Now, at the present time, the technology is still in its early stages. But you can imagine, in the future, having an entire business conference in a virtual world. Imagine celebrating a virtual Christmas party with friends and relatives gathered together in a virtual living room, even if they're thousands of miles away. Imagine a virtual television program. It's just as if you're sitting right there in the audience or right there running on the playing field in an exciting football game. All right. I think the team made this uh, video, you know, like 10, 8 years ago, and then there was a lot of imagination going on over there. Um, but today, as I said before, that really, you know, the reality is now. So what we are actually trying to do is to see if we actually we can actually propose something that's really revolutionary. Uh, so this is a project we call From 3D to Infinity. So what we want actually is to create a new platform to enable uh, a large number of people to be able to interact together in a cyberspace. Right? So there are three components I think that we can actually explore. Uh, imagine that you, know, you can actually have a live event going on. It can be an opera, it can be a lecture, and it even can be as big as a football, uh, a football game. Right? And then that can happen in the Berkeley community. And then what, what we actually imagine are the capability for systems to be able to in real time capture every detail of those performances and then allow the system to broadcast those, those events live. Why we need to broadcast this event live? Because we also want the, the audience to be able to participate also live as part of the event and interact with each other. So this really opened doors from you know, the use cases of one user <coughs> facing one computer uh, you know, into a social network that allowed you know, hundreds or even thousands of people to interact together virtually. Now, how can we do that, right? So, you know, by the way, so I used the, uh, another movie, the, the third movie, you know, the Ender's Game, if we can imagine that, you know, you have persons that really control and experience events that have happened thousands of light years, you know, uh, away from you. Now, uh, now, just to conclude, how can we start, right? So, um, in, in addition to the, the, uh, the, the art and performance uh, uh, teams, we also have a core team in the engineering department, and then the, uh, a new established research center called Center for Augmented Cognition, CAC, .edu. If you want to know more information, go to their website. And then we have faculty members working on a, a wide range of applications and wide range of technologies that really enable new AR and VR applications, such as localization, imaging, immersion, interaction, and different type of applications. So let me just conclude by asking this question. Really, you know, today I think, in, the, in, in particular myself, to come here to come here to actually ask this question, you know, with all you guys, is that can we actually at Berkeley to make the vision of, of Star Trek, Star Wars, and understand a reality? How do we start? I think that a good part to start is to have a great team of really diverse team of committed investigators, such as Shannon, Shankar, Ruchna, Lisa, and also Jack McCauley and with other faculty members. Thank you very much.
um, remind Alan the next time he, you show that Star Trek uh, video for Star Trek reference that Captain Kirk is played by Chris Pine, a Berkeley alum. So you will never find, you never know where you find a Berkeley connection. Uh, all, right. all right, this was pretty. Um, Higgledy piggledies. <laughs> I, I know that it was a huge endeavor to have you all in the room and that we had, to, and that it's a challenge to get um, ideas crystallized and focused when uh, there is such an incredible range of diverse faculty to work with. Ultimately, that's got to be a good problem to have, and we look forward to uh, making sure that that problem only becomes an opportunity and, and, and to generate more opportunities for all of us down the road. Thank you, everyone, for all of your work. So, thank you.